Coming up today on the show, it is preview time. We look ahead to Sunday's matchup at home at Lumen Field. Seahawks hosting the Carolina Panthers. We have some clarity on their quarterback situation today. We'll talk about how Andy Dalton impacts the game. Is Brian Burns going to be healthy? How does that team match up against a Seahawks team coming off a big win in Detroit? Jeff Rickard, program director of WFNZ in North Carolina, joins me next on the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast, in-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Vien. Joining me today on the show, Program Director at WFNZ in Charlotte, North Carolina. And you have probably heard this voice in the past on Sirius XM Satellite uh, Radio or ESPN the old all night show uh, and my old friend and former mentor, Jeff Rickard. Jeff, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing this afternoon, Dan? Not too badly. Getting ready for a home game on what looks to be uh, maybe the last nice-ish weekend that we'll have um, this fall. Weather's supposed to not be a factor at Lumen Field on Sunday. Uh, let's get right into it. One thing that is a factor, uh, it seems this morning we have some clarity on the quarterback situation. Looks like it's going to be Andy Dalton and not the rookie first uh, overall draft pick, Bryce Young. Is that right? Yeah, it looks like Bryce is dealing with an ankle injury that a lot of people didn't notice in the last game that they played at home on Monday mm -hmm. night against the New Orleans Saints. He went for two after a touchdown drive at the very end of the game. Didn't seem to be limping, but then I've seen a few late game plays where he kind of got rolled up on a little bit, even though he didn't pop up limping. People are speculating if that's the play. Uh, Frank Wright kind of surprised all of us yesterday on uh, Wednesday by saying all of a sudden Bryce had an ankle problem, and that was kind of a surprise to everybody else because nobody saw obvious evidence of that. And of course, the conspiracy theorists are out, oh, he didn't have a great couple of first two games, so let's right. put him on the bench and save some face, and we'll go from there. But Look, I've covered Frank uh, for a long time in Indianapolis, as a matter of fact. and th th He doesn't operate that way. Bryce Young doesn't strike me as somebody who's just going to make stuff up. But it looks like Andy Dalton is going to start. Bryce did not practice for the second day in a row. And uh, usually rookies don't do well not practicing all week in their third ever start, Dan. Right, especially coming off a short week, as you mentioned. Uh, the other thing uh, that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of chatter online already uh, we should have known this, you know, this guy's, he's, 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 he's small ish. His body isn't built to, to, you know, kind of handle the rigors of the NFL up until this point. Uh, even though he struggled, uh, Carolina's passing offense dead last in the league in yards per game. Hey, have you at least seen some signs, um, that they took the right guy at one? Well, he doesn't look overwhelmed. You know, we've seen rookies play quarterback in the past that have the wide eyes. It looks like they're just in a hurry to get rid of the football, and they're kind of trying to figure out what's going on. He seems more frustrated by the fact that his receivers don't get open. I mean, you can look at all the film you want over the first two games. There's not much, if any, separation going on there. Now, you take a rookie quarterback who's still trying to figure things out, used to bigger windows in college football, and right now an offensive line that's not giving him a ton of time to throw – I'd say it's been a group effort so far. And look, we're two games in, and for the crowd that they're already saying, see, he's too small, he's already getting hurt, Anthony Richardson hasn't finished either of his starts yet. Right. I mean, it's the National Football League. Yeah. Um, I and he's already, been, he's already been anointed by some yes. as the next great one after two games. So. And, and I don't know if Bryce Young is going to be a great quarterback or an average quarterback or a bust. I mean, we're, we're two games in, and I will say this, He's had a chance to lead his team to a game-tying or game-winning drive at the end of both of his first two football games, so it's not like he's been completely blown out. He does look like he's a rookie at this point in time. He doesn't look like he's going to lift the team up and put him on his back, but he also is far from the reason that they are 0-2 right now. Let's talk about Andy Dalton. He's got a lot of connections here uh, to Seattle. There was, uh, It's been – Pretty widely um, reported that in 2011 they gave strong consideration to taking him. They needed a quarterback then. It was the, you know, the beginning of the the Carroll Schneider regime. They passed on him. They had other needs at offensive line. They took their first two picks for offensive linemen that year, uh, and then obviously the next year they they took Russell Wilson in the third round. Um, Dalton has had a lot of success against Seattle in particular, uh, almost 70% completion percentage, averaging nearly 300 yards per game, seven touchdowns in four games. Uh, I don't think he played that badly in new Orleans last year. Does right now with everything you just said about Bryce and his development, 
Um, does Andy Dalton give the Panthers a better chance to win on Sunday? We were having the discussion on my show at WFNZ today. Andy Dalton has won 83 games in the National Football League. He's, he's a 12-year veteran. He's been around. He's seen a few things. It's hard for me to imagine that a guy with two career starts gives you a better opportunity right here and right now to win a football game. Now Bryce is younger. He's more mobile. Uh, one thing that they are saying internally and externally is he does not have a problem with processing information. Like I said, he doesn't look like the moment's too big for him. He just can't find an open receiver, and he hasn't had much time to do so. I, I would give him an incomplete at this point in time. I don't know how you grade a quarterback who just doesn't have much going for him around him at yeah. this point in time. So I would say that Andy Dalton gives the Panthers at least the same shot of winning as the starting quarterback right now, just based on experience alone, right? Yeah. Yeah, the receiver issue is something Dan Orlovsky talked about a lot on the broadcast and has mm -hmm. since then on ESPN this week. Just guys not getting open. Uh, you know, Adam, they brought in Adam Thielen this year. He's, he's more of a safety blanket at, at this point. A lot was expected of Jonathan Mingo, the rookie out of Old Miss. How has he looked in his development so far? Looks like a, a rookie that's played two games at wide receiver in the National Football League. Like, I, I get kind of hit on by fans on my show sometimes because I think I give a realistic view. I mean, you and I have been covering the NFL for a long, long time. Rookie wide receiver Justin Jefferson didn't come out flying his first three games. It took him the second half of the season, and then in his second season, he really took off. I'm not saying John Domingo is Justin Jefferson by any stretch of the imagination. I just don't know how you really truly grade these guys after two games behind – already a makeshift offensive line they're they're dealing with two guards that are starting right now that were not their projected starters at this point in time their left tackle is now two games into his second season he's mm -hmm. doing okay they got a rookie quarterback their most dependable wide receiver as you pointed out is adam thielen who's probably on the very tail end of his career dj shark has been hurt he was going to be their their long threat he's not been able to play and really hasn't been a part of camp all that much and then you got Jonathan Mingo and Terrace Marshall Jr., who really never has blossomed. I just think it's a really tough, tough spot for a rookie quarterback to be in right now, despite the fact that you've got Frank Reich and Thomas Brown and you've got quarterback coaches and you've got former head coaches and advisors and they're, they're coach heavy, but that doesn't really help you out on the field sometimes. I, I just think I'll be more comfortable making a, a judgment on the Carolina Panthers in week 12 than I am in week two with all this stuff going on. And it might sound like I'm making excuses, but that's just the way it is. And in the NFL, they don't care that you're down to your second string guards. They don't care that you've got a quarterback with two starts. They don't care that you've got wide receivers that can't get separation. They're going to feast. And that's exactly what the defenses of Atlanta and New Orleans have done the first two weeks. And then you would think with struggles in the passing game, you'd, you'd try – at least to, to lean on your running game. Uh, what's the latest on Miles Sanders? I know he's been limited in practice this week. Yeah, he's going to be okay. He did practice uh, today. Brian Burns had been limping around a little bit. The linebacker, he's practicing. And so other than the previously reported injuries to, to Bryce, it seems like they're going to be as healthy as they can be, given where they came out of the Monday night game. Um, but one of the things they're going to have to do is what they did last year when, when these two teams played is they ran the football really well. Now, yeah. you remember that game. There was no 100-yard rusher, per se, no. for the Carolina Panthers, but they had a couple of guys. I mean, it was just Deontay Foreman and Chuba Hubbard again and again mm -hmm. and again, I think 220-plus yards against the Seahawks. And honestly, that's really the best chance that Carolina would have in my mind to compete with Seattle is to try and run. But they've not done that well, especially in that Monday night game. People were getting on Frank Wright because he wasn't running the ball more. And his point was, well, we were behind the sticks the entire time. They would run a lot on first down and it would be second and nine or second and 10 or second and 11 and started to take some of those run possibilities away. So, you know, if they, if they want to beat Seattle, they're going to have to run the football. There's no question about that. I just don't know if they have enough going on around them to go on the road and beat a, a Seahawks team that we at least know can put up some points this year, right? Yeah, and, and and certainly that approach seems to be one that everyone's going to continue to take. The Seahawks famously struggled against the run last year. It appears to be better in a small sample size so far this year, but it'll be another good test for them. And if there is a formula 
for for the Panthers to win Sunday. Um, we talked about Dalton's contributions to that, just a steadying influence on offense. But this defense is pretty darn good, and it's really the the foundation of this roster right now. And you talked about Brian Burns; it appears he's going to play. Derek Brown up front, and and some talented guys in the secondary. I want to talk about Frankie Louvu though, and not just yeah. you know not just for the the WSU connection. Um, undrafted out out of WSU in 2018, he was a good player at Wazoo, kind of a Pac-12 honorable mention type ish. Uh, Never really looked like a guy who was going to be a breakout star in the NFL, but every once in a while, a guy comes along, and it's so much fun to watch that you can just see the growth year after year. And and he'll flash and then continue to grow. We see guys flash and disappear, but Luvu hasn't done anything like that. And now it looks like the way he's starting off this season, 14 tackles so far, two and a half sacks. He's everywhere. He's all around the ball. That This guy is at least on the verge, if he's not there already, of being a star. I thought the second half of the season last year, he started that trajectory and he's picked up right where he left off. He had a great camp. He's had a first couple of good games. He uh, He's worked really, really hard, but, and, and you can speak to this better than I can when he was at Washington State. One thing he's demonstrated to me over the last season and a half is he's got a nose for the football. He just knows where to be. He's become one of those guys that you look and you go, oh, there's Frankie Luvu. He's right there. What's going on? Where's he at all the time? I think he's just worked really hard. He's worked hard on his craft. I think he understands the game and he's got physical ability and he's putting all that together. And I think you are seeing a maturation of him and his abilities this year. It's been fun to watch. You talked about Brian Burns, one of the elite pass rushers in the NFL. There were, you know, he's, he's in a, the last year of his rookie deal. He's looking for a new big, big contract. They couldn't get it done the off season. There were rumors of the trade deadline last year, that the Rams tried really hard to make a push for him. You talked before we hit record today about some conspiracy theorists, you know, <laughs> implying that this injury might be a little bit more show. Um, do you think the contract is impacting him in any way on the field? No, because one thing he he went right up to the day or two before the first regular season game, and then he came out and he said, "I'm going to play. Yeah. Whatever happens, I'm going to play. We'll talk about the contract later." And I think the longer it goes on, the worse it probably gets for the Carolina Panthers because we've already seen one huge deal done with uh, Bosa in San Francisco getting, what, $34 million. There are a couple of other elite edge rushers that are on the block that are about to get theirs. And people here kind of started to think that, well, you know, Brian Burns is right on that precipice of being a star. Maybe he's not quite a star. He had 12, I think 12 and a half sacks last year. Um but he's also the best pass rusher that they have. And I would think still just coming into his prime would be someone that Carolina would be interested in signing for a long period of time. And to me, the price goes up. Like if he has a really good year, let's say he has 14 sacks and he's got one and a half or maybe two and a half already. Now that I think about it this year, uh, that price is just going to go up and up and up if he has a successful year. And it'll be interesting to see what the Carolina Panthers do with him. But he's a gamer, as, as you like to say, the old cliche. He decided, I'm a football player. That's what I want to do. I want to help my team. I believe in these guys, and I want to go out there and play with them. So I, I give him a lot of credit for that. And as much as the storyline of the Seahawks win over the Lions this week was the performance of their backup tackles, you know, pretty much shutting down that pass rush of the Lions and keeping Aiden Hutchinson at bay, Burns has to be licking his chops a little bit, wanting to take a shot at those guys. Um, so. yeah, and, and, you know, really, Brown has become formidable in the middle where he's going to occupy yeah. two guys. Yeah. That, that's the thing that he's yeah. been able to do. So see what It'll they can test. do. It'll be a and test for the interior offensive line for sure. The defense is certainly that front seven is certainly the strength of this Carolina Panthers team. Now, keep in mind, J.C. Horn is out for a while. He's going to remain out. He's going to have to have surgery on a hamstring. And so Jack he's not going to be there. So what was already kind of a you hope things are going to go OK secondary is now a little bit thin. And, you know, Gino got his stuff together last week. If he plays in the fourth quarter in overtime like he did in fourth quarter of overtime last week, that could be a problem for Carolina. The loss of Shaq Thompson, uh, what does that mean to that defense? He's their spiritual leader. He, he's the guy, I don't know if you saw when that happened, but there were 52 other guys out next to him. When that cart was called, immediately the entire bench emptied and they went out to be with their guy. He is the emotional leader. He's kind of the heartbeat of the team. And so they are certainly going to miss 
he's become a better player. He's a, he's a good player. Not, I wouldn't call him like a perennial pro bowler, but he's a really good player. But more importantly, that team looked to him for leadership. And so that's that's going to be something they're going to have to overcome out on the field as well. Scott Fitterer now in his second year as general manager there, second or third? Third, I think, yeah. Uh, obviously he, he worked his way up under John Schneider, uh, his mentor coming up through the Seahawks front office before he got that opportunity. Um, does this game mean a little bit more to him? You think than any of the others on the calendar facing his mentor? I'm sure it does. I mean, you want to show well to the people, you know, and the people who've influenced you and you want to kind of show off what you have, but at the end of the day too, it's, it's just one game in the standings and you want to show up and you want to play well. And if you're Carolina, you want to get your first win of the year. I think Scott Fitterer and, is, is a guy from my perspective, you know, I wouldn't say the clock is ticking by any stretch of the imagination, but he traded for Bryce Young. He traded away Christian McCaffrey. He traded DJ Moore. He did not trade Brian Burns. He brought in a brand new coaching staff. He was the guy that tried Baker Mayfield and that didn't work out at some point over the next two years, I would say, you're going to have to show that everything you did was worth something, or you're going to be back to the drawing board again. And I think, Again, I don't want to say that the clock is ticking on him. I wouldn't say the seat is hot. But if things don't go well this year and there's not at least progress shown, I think then maybe you start to look at next year as a really important year for Scott Fitter. Well, it's just the um, the reality of the current NFL. Uh, teams, just, you're tied to your quarterback choice when you're rebuilding like he is. You know, he's going to be judged by not just – how Bryce Young develops, but how well C.J. Stroud plays and how well Anthony Richardson plays. And that's just the reality. We're seeing it in Chicago right now where everyone wants to give up on on Justin Fields. And if they do, then then the GM and the coach probably go too. So, well, you, you and I are old guys now in covering the NFL. Remember when when a quarterback really didn't hit his stride till his third, fourth, maybe his fifth year? And now you've got like play? a season and a half and people are like, next, let's go. I mean, yeah. look, look at how long it took Geno to kind of find – his rhythm and his perfect place and his stride, and he's playing at a really high level. Yeah. Yeah, I think the best example, that's Anthony Richardson. I love the talent and the character of that kid. I loved him coming out. There was a lot of talk here that the Seahawks might have taken him at five if he was there, but I didn't think he was anywhere near playing on day one, and I thought they went out and got a guy that can play and you can win with in the meantime in Gardner Minshew, and nope, they just anointed him as a starter week two because they have so much invested in him. They got to find out. It's It's... It's one of the biggest changes we've seen in the NFL over the last. Yeah, season. no. If you if you're drafted in a top five situation in the NFL, man, they want you to perform right now. And if you don't, you kind of get behind the eight ball, and you can get left behind, and yeah. and it might not work out for you, and you might end up being a pretty good quarterback way down the line. But you're going to have to find the right place in the right time. Like I don't know, it's two games. Do we really believe Baker Mayfield finally found a home in Tampa? Right. Right. Yeah. You know, and to, to another point, too, your guy, Gardner Minshew, he's one of those guys that people have been trying to better deal his entire career. He's got mm -hmm. pretty good career statistical numbers. Yeah. Like he, he's, I think, over a 65 percent completion rate and I think 45 touchdowns to 15 interceptions. He's not a bad guy to have as your backup quarterback. He's won yeah. some games, too. He, he reminds me, I get the baseball analogy would be he's one of those long relievers, you know, that you can yeah. use in a spot start and he's really effective. But if you go, hey, he's pitched really well the last two, three times out, right. let's throw him in the rotation that over time, you know, teams figure him out or whatever. Just And that's just limited physically and, and how that plays in. All right, my friend. Well, thanks for all the uh, good information. Um, listen, uh, I'm not a betting guy. I typically don't like doing predictions. But knowing everything you know about this team and with knowing that Dalton's going to be the guy on Sunday, what what kind of odds do you give him to, to pull out a win on Sunday? I don't know how they score points. I don't know how they score more than 16 or 17. You see how fans players. right now would be going, hmm, have you seen our defense over the last couple I, years? I would think that this could be a big day for a guy like DK Metcalf because mm -hmm. he's big and physical and strong and fast and can get loose. I don't know who the, who the Panthers have in their secondary that can deal with a guy like that, mm -hmm. much less a, a crafty guy who's always open. Like, like, um, I just, block Tyler yeah, yeah, yeah. Block. the guy I mean, to just keep on taking. I, I would think it would be a really good weekend for your wide receivers. I do. All right. Well, let's hope you're right. You heard it from him. <laughs> I'll get in trouble for saying that, but that's kind of <laughs> how it looks right now. Nobody in North Carolina is going to watch this show. Famous last words. <laughs>
Uh, that is program director from WFNZ, Jeff Ricker. Jeff, thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks, Dan. Always good to talk to you, buddy. All right, buddy. See you. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you are watching on the YouTube channel, like this video, subscribe to the channel. That way you never miss episodes and you support the channel. You want to support me and the channel? Buy me a coffee or a beer. Link is in the description. And if you want to get rid of those ads on Spotify, you can subscribe for 99 cents a month. Link is in the description to the show. Until next time, I am Dan Viennes. You are listening to Seahawks Forever. I'll be back Sunday with my reaction after the game, although I'm going to the game, so it'll be a little later than normal. Until then, as always, forever and always, go Hawks.